Welcome to the Rest of Us Podcast. My name is Noah Hutton, and I'm your host. Each week, I'll have a new entrepreneur on to talk about their story, their struggles, and their lessons learned. This week, my guest is Lucas Fonseco. He is the founder of Language Matters, which is a language learning company, and I am really excited to share his story with you. It's really interesting about how he got the company started, how he formed partnerships to grow it, um, and just all the different parts of the story. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Lucas Fonseco. Lucas Fonseca, welcome to the Rest of Us podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, I'm very excited to share your story. You have a very interesting business. Um, I heard about it through uh, an event, a local event for entrepreneurs here in Warsaw, Indiana. And so I'm really excited to have you on and share about that. So before we get into your entrepreneurial story, I'll just have you kind of share a little bit about yourself and about your business. Yeah. So first, thank you for inviting me. I, I think this is a great opportunity that you're giving entrepreneurs so I'm just going to tell you a quick overview of how, of how I actually got here to the U.S. I'm originally from Chile. I moved when I was uh, 19 to come to college. I came to study business at uh, Grace College, and I uh, came with a tennis scholarship. And I just, you know, my family, I have a lot of people who do business back home. So it was just what I knew I wanted to do. And when I was in my sophomore year is when I decided – you know, I, I remember being in my in my dorm room, sitting down and thinking, this is great. I, I love the opportunity I'm having. And how can I make this accessible to other people around the world? And I think that really was the start of Language Matters. We started as a company that wanted to provide opportunities to people around the world through uh, learning, through learning English and being able to experience uh, the experience I was having here. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely want to get into that story. I want to back up a little bit. I didn't realize that you were a tennis player. At Grace, did you know a guy named Danila Kukurlan? Uh, yeah, he actually, he was my roommate for like four years. Oh, and really? We were very good friends. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, yeah. I was recently in Bloomington. He's there. Okay. And I stayed with him. We've, we've been connected. And, and so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I played tennis in high school and I took a few lessons with him uh, back when he was at Grace. So that was just kind of funny that, that you... Uh, played grace at tennis yeah yeah or wow. tennis at grace yeah. yeah yeah so back to your business while we're actually here um let's just kind of start in with your story of entrepreneurship let's dive a little bit deeper into you know why you got started with the business um and yeah. where the kind of idea for our language matters started yes so uh again i when i got to the u.s and i had this opportunity to come study here and realize how you know how cool and different just being here studying and meeting people uh, how that how cool that was uh, I just really started thinking how can I give this opportunity to other people in my country and around the world and I realized that one of the main uh, factors that don't allow people to come here is English and you know being able to speak the language and so that's when we started language matters we said we're going to create a program that only only or, or only focuses on teaching the abilities that someone needs to be able to come and use the language practically. Um, and so we started doing that. We hired people at the college. I was still a sophomore in college, so there were a lot of things I didn't know. Um, but we started offering the service to people abroad, and we had some of our first students come to the U.S. and experience uh, what I was experiencing. And, and I think that was, you know, that that's what really moved the needle at that point. Things have changed ever since, but that moved the needle in terms of that was the mission, the vision, and things were working out. So um, that was great at that point. Yeah. So when you were first getting started in learning how to, you know, communicate English to people and teach English to people, did you know kind of the structure of an English language course, or did you have to kind of figure out like, how do I actually teach non-native speakers of English to learn English? Because like learning a language, no matter what, some languages are harder than others. It's a very difficult task. And I assume if, you know, coming from different countries, maybe their native, their, their native language, it makes it even harder to learn English just because of the differences in the different, I don't know, dialects or different um, structures of the language and uh, different words, like some words in other languages, we don't have words for that, or they don't have words for what so we that words that we use. So, how did you kind of learn how to actually teach English to people? 
Yeah. So at first, I, I'm going to be honest, there, there were a lot of things I didn't know. I had to learn a lot of things along the way. And I got a lot of great mentors who taught me and, and people that showed me this is the way. Uh, this is how actually people learned. And that combined with my experience and the experience of other people, we beta tested programs and we realized, well, there are a couple of things that are working well here and some others that are fluff, things that are actually not working. They're just to keep people busy. And so it's been, you know, to be honest, it's been a, um, it's, it's been a, a continuous research, trying to find the best way to teach someone something that they can actually output something that they can actually use in their daily conversations that they can use at work, that they can use to communicate, to come to college, different things that actually change their lives. And, and so at first it was a lot of trying things, figuring it out, uh, learning, because I didn't know, and my team didn't know all the things. Now it's different because we hire people that have the expertise. We've gotten really good over the years uh, knowing what works, uh, educating ourselves around the topic. But, but yeah, it, it is different depending on who you're teaching and the culture you're teaching because it's different teaching Spanish to English speakers than it is to teach uh, English to Spanish speakers. So it's a different, completely different uh, kind of work. Yeah, and yeah. you talked about kind of the different areas where like maybe some things work and then some things that are just like fluff and they don't actually matter and they're not, you know, let's not teach those anymore because it's just giving them busy work basically. What were some of those things that you learned that you thought might have been effective in learning English but were just kind of fluff? Yeah, so uh, I go back to my high school and middle school years and I think that uh, you probably can relate to this. A lot of people can we learn a lot of things that we were never going to use. For example, vocabulary that is not necessary and that it just takes space in our brains. Animals, fruits, vegetables, things that honestly we don't need in a daily conversation, but we learn them because they're a part of a unit or whatever we're learning. And then when we actually have to speak to someone, that's not useful. It's just, you know, we're not going to use that vocabulary. And instead of worrying about the communication, that is the most important part of being able to communicate. We worry about words that don't amount to anything because words by the, themselves don't mean anything. We need to put them in context and we need to make them usable and so useful. So we, um, you know, take off all of those things. We worry about uh, communication, real communication. And uh, we focus on that because otherwise we're, spending time developing a skill that's completely different speaking the way we're doing it now is completely different than sitting down and learning a bunch of vocabulary and different skills yeah so what are what are some of the things that when you are teaching them what are the, some of those like necessary things that you're teaching them to communicate is it like how to ask for directions or is it how to like talk to people and converse with people or like are there other like areas that i'm not even thinking about that would be necessary for non-English English speakers to learn? The, the most basic and that I tell, we tell all of our students and I tell people that want to learn on their own is that they need to learn how to communicate simple things with simple words because we use the same words. Even in this conversation, we're using the same 100, 200, 300 words. We just put them in different orders, communicate something different. So what I tell people is, Learn few things that you can use really well and don't focus on learning all of these vocabulary words that then you have no idea how to connect. So instead of worrying about all these vocabulary sets and concepts, concepts kill communicate. I think learning grammar and concepts that kills communication skills because it, it's just too much for the brain. When you and I are speaking right now, we're not thinking about, I need to conjugate this verb into this. And then, you know, this word changes to this. It just, it doesn't happen that way. So we teach people to um, create sentences that are response that is their reactions to things they're hearing. So, cause that's, that's what we really do. And we stay away from the, you know, think about all the rules to construct a sentence and then say it because it's too slow a process, different process too. Yeah, I definitely agree. I took a couple years of Spanish and or semesters of Spanish in college and it was just a lot of grammar in kind of like the different tenses and, you know, all these different like areas of grammar. And I, I did awful. Like I was just, I was bad. Part of it was like, I just didn't want to be there because it was a requirement and I didn't really want to learn another language, which I think is a, a reality 
uh, for a lot of students. Um, but you know, but I think part of the reason I didn't want to be there is because I didn't want to learn, you know, the past, present participle or whatever of a of a word. Like I didn't want to learn that. I wanted to be able to like you know go to a Spanish speaking country and like be able to at least get around a little bit. Like maybe I'll get laughed at because I say something wrong. I'll say something in a different order. But like I at least want to be like trying. And I don't think you know in like if you take a college course unless you're getting into the advanced stuff and you're dedicating your like years of your time to taking these college courses or even in high school taking you know multiple semesters and multiple years of a language you're not really getting that education so i like your approach of um just kind of cutting out all the fluff and being like how can you get around in the world like how can you communicate and get things done and then all those other things will come you know you'll learn the word for the animals you'll learn the word for the food you'll learn all these different words and you'll be able to get around in, in you know, in the U.S. or in another English-speaking country, just, and then those things will come, which I, I think is a really good approach because, um, and I think this is a lot of, I talk about this a lot with like business-related um, concepts in college. I feel like college is really behind in how the world works. You know, you're you're learning at a very academic level, and for yeah. some people, that's great. You know, you're learning the textbook concepts, the high-level concepts, and that's fantastic. You can, you know, go academic, the academic route of any. Um, area you can study you know spanish in an academic way or english in an academic way or you can just be able to navigate the world and start a business and you know do all these things and in college i don't think we really get that that education and i'm seeing you know talking to you that that's the same thing with language and i kind of experienced that too um in the same way i love that analogy because it's exactly what i'm trying to get across here is the fact that we learn all the book kind of content from anything we're learning, but then when we have to go and apply it, we have learned how to do that. We don't know how to do that. We just know how to, you know, talk about the concepts we've learned, but we have no idea how they apply to the real world. And so it is different if I tell you, hey, you're going to learn today present tense, past tense, uh, all these different grammar points and the pronouns and the adjectives and, you know, and, and all these demonstratives. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm already learning a whole nother language to understand what you're saying. And it's annoying because instead of doing that, what we really should be doing is today you're going to learn how to talk about your week. You're going to learn how to talk about your business. You're going to learn how to talk about your family because those are real communication goals. Present, past, grammar points are not communication points. They're tools. And the problem that we do in schools and, you know, we've done, we've made this mistake in the past too, is that we use those tools as the goal instead of teaching those as tools that help us accomplish something, then they become the main worry. And nobody wants to learn present. That's nothing. What is that going to do for my life? Nothing. Um, unless you have the vision and you're, you know, have academic, uh, you're very academically minded and you're, you can see why that is important. But most people just want to learn a goal that helps them in life. Yeah, I think for it's sure. Like business. Exactly. Yeah, I, lo- I love I, I love all the ideas you're kind of bringing to this um, and your approach to learning language. I definitely want to get into that more later in the podcast, but I want to get back to your story a little bit and talk about kind of how you grew the business and how you maybe got your first clients. So when you were starting this business, what were you going back to your hometown in Chile and saying, you know, I'm going to teach people or were you finding other clients in other areas of the world or other areas at Grace that uh, could learn from you? Yeah, so at first we were just selling we were just reaching out to people in my country and abroad because the whole vision and you know businesses uh, change over time but at the beginning it was giving the opportunity i had that my brother had uh, to people abroad through a program that takes off the fluff that is effective so that they are spending the money right and they actually get to accomplish what they want to accomplish that was the main goal uh, and then that changed when we realized that here in indiana there is such a need for language services language access translation uh, companies struggling to connect with spanish speakers and people from different cultures we saw so much opportunity beyond just teaching the language and, and that's why the company grew we have to expand the vision the mission of the company and we realized we need more people and uh, we want to do more because there's a lot to be done still. And and so I think, I think I say in my mind for me, when the, the business really grew, when our decision to make the scope larger grew, I think that's the moment when the business really grew 
yes, of course, you need to get the contracts. But when you decide that your business is going to do all of these things, I believe is when the business really starts to grow because then you prepare yourself to that growth and you actually start doing things to make yourself bigger. And, and I think that doesn't happen just overnight. I think that's a decision you make and then you make little decisions that lead you to a bigger business. And we experienced that through the services we were offering, the team we were hiring, and then the contracts we were signing because we could do it. Yes, for sure. I love that. And um, I, I want to kind of hear about you know the the scope of the business and how you expanded that, but uh, I also want to talk about the contracts you got because that's I mean how you grow your business is you get business from people. Yeah. So so in the beginning, you know, you went from maybe educating individual people, I assume, or um, you know, a couple individual people to getting bigger contracts from local community uh, organizations or businesses. What were what was kind of that growth moment of we have our first big contract and we can kind of grow the business there? Um, and what did that look like? I actually like this story and I tried to tell all my employees because a lot of them come in now and they take it for granted because they haven't, they didn't see when we were making no money and we were struggling or we were, we were starting out. Um, so I, I tried to teach the, or to put this in the training for everybody that joins along. Uh, but we, you know, I think the, the, the first big contract, I know the first big contract was Grace College, which is where I went to. We took their entire tutoring program and we transformed it. We transformed it. We enhanced it. Um, we made it something that is just very practical. That that is, you know, a part of the students' experience as they're learning a language. We're really preparing the preparing them to apply the things that they're learning in the classroom, and and and, and we're hiring people from different countries and we're having them interact in real settings so that they practice that part of the language that in my opinion is the most important communication how how can you actually use these things that are not just academic for me they're anything but, but academic because they allowed me to come here to talk to people to to do life and so i wanted people to see that that was our first big contract and i was uh i think i was i was at the end of my sophomore year when that happened and is when we re realized with this contract, we can take the business and we can start looking at it more seriously. Because at the beginning, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory for this, but at the beginning, uh, you can choose if you add this to the podcast or not. But uh, at the beginning, we were like a club. We're a club of people, 13 people, I think. And all of us were having weekly meetings at the library at Grace College and I was just giving them updates. This is these are the clients we have. Maybe we had two clients, 13 people. This is what we want to accomplish. We were showing little progress and people just wanted to be there because they loved the vision and the mission of the company. They just liked what we wanted to do. Uh, and that's changed now because people now are actually getting paid and 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 people join because they have their own reasons to be joining language matters. But uh, but I like that we've maintained that culture of people that want to be part of the team and uh, um, that believe in what we're doing. And so is yeah, they're getting paid, but it's also what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, buying into the mission is probably one of the most important things for any company, whether you're doing, you know, some ta like very tactical work or very like strategy based work um, or very like mission oriented work. Buying into whatever you're doing is so important because not only will you be, be a better uh, employee and be a better you know part of the company, but you'll actually enjoy going to work every day. And that's not something that everybody can say because they get a job that, uh, or they do a job that you know maybe they don't enjoy, but it's a paycheck. But it sounds like for your employees, it's not just a paycheck. It's kind of contributing to this larger mission and this larger goal of you know bringing the English language to a lot of different uh, non-native uh, speakers of English. So. I want to get more into that grace contract because I'm curious kind of the structure of it. And I don't know how much you could talk about it, um, you know, money wise and stuff like that. But what did that look like when did grace come to you or did you go to grace? And then what did the actual like partnership between language matters and grace look like? like what were you doing on a daily basis with them? Yeah. So um, the contract was really simple. I was tutor. I was a Spanish tutor at, at the time at, at grace and I realized that it was very you know, I don't want to talk badly about it, but it was not organized. It was not something 
that was working in collaboration with the current program at Grace. It was almost its own thing. And I, I thought this would be more valuable if we could actually do something with the school that is more incorporated into the, the student's experience. And so what we really did is we took this, you know, one the one-on-one tutors that were tutoring people, not knowing how to do it sometimes and, and not knowing how they could really help the students into an organized program where we would train the tutors, we would hire them, we would put them into teams. Now we developed a team dynamic where someone uh, who is a foreigner would, would teach Spanish along alongside someone who has learned who had learned Spanish. And so we have this combination of let's say you learned Spanish, you know how an American or English speakers learn and so you would teach with me so we get the best of both worlds to teach a student and so that was one of the biggest changes we made and then um we just organized the entire thing we created an entire program we created an entire culture around the program and we yeah we started creating curriculum and and helping the professors just you know have the students practice and utilize that language the languages uh that they were learning in the classroom so, uh, oh, no, keep no. going. Sorry. Go for it. I was going to say, is is the program at Grace now, is it more kind of your style of, of teaching language where it's more conversational and, um, you know, learning everyday kind of concepts or is it still kind of a little bit of that fluff and grammar or is it like more academic than it usually is at a college? So we try to be, and I, and I say try because sometimes we get students that just are not getting it in class. So we go back to, hey, let's let's look at this again and we're, we'll teach you this part again. Uh, make sure that you get it. But um, we try to be the uh, practical part of the program, of the whole language program for Grace. And so our goal is that students come to, you know, the 30 minute, an hour that they have with us and that they practice. They practice to speak with us and they just get good at that. So... The answer is no, we are, we're not the fluff. We try to be just the practical part. We don't want to fill their heads with things that they're not going to use, but we follow our curriculum because we work with the, the college very closely. So we follow that curriculum to make it practical. And, and I will, I will say, I have to say one of my mentors is from Grace. And so he believes in what I, what, what we're doing with language matters. And he knows that we have the opportunity to do it because we don't have to follow all of this structure that they have to abide by in the classroom. So, yeah. Yeah. I will say kind of going out that mentorship point, I think, you know, young entrepreneurs kind of coming into their business and growing their business confidence is super important and being confident in what you're doing and kind of carrying yourself on your own, on your own, as you go into client meetings and meeting with different uh, you know, potential collaborators, but having an older mentor, you know, somebody that has been in the business or done it or can vouch for you um, and believe in what you're doing is is crucial. I, I think, you know, you can have the most confidence in the world, but if, you know, you see everybody around you kind of doubting what you're doing, especially like older people that you like look up to and respect, that can, you know, kill your confidence as much as you want to bring it up. So having at least one person that says like, hey, you're struggling right now, but I see what you're doing. And, you know, that, I see that you have some su- success in the future. Is there anything I can do to help, you know, guide you and uh, mentor you in that? I think that's so crucial. So I-, I think it's really cool that you found a mentor that is like believes in that with the company because, um, you know, young, young entrepreneurs, especially people my age, like we have a lot of like confidence, maybe a chip on our shoulder of like people don't, you know, get what we're doing or people don't believe in us. But, you know, having those one or two people that do believe in you is, is really important and can really push you in your business and in your uh, growth journey a lot. One hundred percent. Yeah, I encourage all the people uh, that go into business um, get mentors. I get ben- I have like four. I have five mentors, and I go to them for different things. I know they're busy, so I try to have people that can help me uh, throughout the year. And I don't want to abuse those relationships, but I really, really, when I don't know something, I go to them and I ask them, "Hey, what do you think about this?" Because I, uh, one thing that is so funny because. Over the time, you know, as I get better at doing this thing, I feel that I have less answers and I find myself asking more things to mentors because I realized that what the experience has taught me is that asking more is always better. And so I ask my mentors all the time. I ask my mentors things for things more now than I used to when I started out uh, because I thought I could do it all. And then I realized, wow, it takes one conversation to make this thing way better. 
And so, but that, that I had to learn over time that that's the case. Yeah. I think, you know, when you're starting out, you don't know the right questions to ask. You're just kind of like, how do I do this? I don't know what to do. Like, how do I do accounting? How do I do, you know, how do I do course building? How do I do curriculum building? How do I meet with a client? Like you're asking all these super high level questions, but once you actually learn how to do that and you're getting some of those meetings or doing some of that work, then it's like, you know, how do I structure my taxes to be really good for this year? Or how do I write this type of curriculum to meet the student where they are? You know, exactly. the, the like, if we have like a one through 10 scale, 10 being the most proficient and one being the least proficient, like, how do I write a curriculum that is for a two student versus an eight student? Like, how do I like all these different things? Like, they're very specific questions. And I think that that's really important to learn, even in the beginning, when you have all these high level questions. If you're going to any sort of coaching or mentoring or any like type of, um, you know, a business oriented uh, learning experience, finding those specific questions to ask is super important because that's how you're going to get the most value. And then later on, you know, you can ask more, more specific questions. Like you, there, I don't think anybody should be discouraging you to ask questions. And so they should always encourage you to ask more. And so, you know, maybe you have five now and then you'll come with five later and then you ask five again. And like, you know, so at, like finding those specific questions will give you the most value out of any sort of mentorship or coaching experience or, you know, advisory experience. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, can, you, can you repeat that part? The last part? I was going to say like, uh, yeah, asking specific questions is going to give you the most value out of all the, like your mentorship experience that you have. Yeah, no, I 100%. I, I think that I know what kind of questions to ask now. Uh, I think way better than I used to. And I realized that the main change is that I can be more specific, which is exactly what you were saying. Uh, I don't go to my mentors and ask them for, I don't know how to grow my business. Can you help me? That's just gonna, you know, it's, it's terrible for a mentor to hear that. Cause I, I think, I think that how would I respond to that question? I don't know. It's, it's just too broad. Yeah. Uh, there's so many things that go into it. So I think we get better at knowing what questions to ask. And I think mentors appreciate when you're specific because they can help you, but they don't know how, because they don't know what you you're thinking about what you're going through. So definitely yeah, I, for I sure. I totally agree with that part. Yeah. Yeah. So now I want to kind of jump ahead a little bit in your kind of business journey to um, this incubator that uh, the local economic development corporation here, KEDCO, uh, the Kosciuszko County or Kosciuszko economic development corporation, um, ran and I kind of want to talk about your experience in that incubator um, why you chose to go that route of an incubator and um, you know the decision there and then what you got out of that incubator and what you learned in the process yeah so I same same answer that I've or, or along the same lines um, I, I choose to work or I, ch I choose to find learning opportunities for myself because it's so funny. We're going through college and we don't want to be in class <laughs> because we, we hate it. And, and when you're out of college, you realize how important those learning experiences are. Well, I seek learning experiences all the time for all kinds of things, books, uh, webinars, um, in incubators, uh, accelerators, anything that can help me learn and stay relevant because things change so quickly. I remember when I went through college, um, the thing to do uh, to start a business was a business plan. And now we're talking about executive summaries and, and, and the lean canvas and doing everything faster. And it makes sense because people don't want to sit through pages and pages of a business plan anymore. And, and some, some places do one that banks and, and other institutions, but I think, Business is always changing so much that that's the main reason why I always want to stay relevant and go into learning opportunities. And I think what I got the most out of uh, the, this incubator in, in Casiasco County was uh, just realizing what my business or the point my business was at, at the point I went through the incubator and realizing the opportunities and the things that I had to improve. And so for someone that runs his business full time, going to an incubator that is three days, full-time three days, that is a big, you know, that's a big commitment because that's time that I'm not with my team. That's time that I'm not really producing something for the business itself. But it's actually more important because we're working on developing that whole infrastructure. And if we never give, a, give ourselves the chance to do that, the business will never grow. We, we would have a nice employment through the business, but the business stops being a business, begins being an employment opportunity. And so I take time out of my schedule to meet with mentors, to learn, 
to to you just try to step back and look at the entire get a better perspective of, of where we're at, what we're doing, how we can improve things. And I think that's really important to do. It's hard to do. Uh, I didn't start doing that until I was two to three years in because I thought that all the answers were inside language matters. And then I realized that a lot of the answers are actually completely outside of language matters. So, um, yeah, I would say that's why I joined the incubator. It's been great. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of useful information and practical knowledge that we're applying now we we we're growing because of it so it was a great experience yeah i i definitely find myself spending a lot more time talking to people than i do almost doing work in a way um some weeks are different you know i have more meetings or less meetings but you know if if somebody reaches out to me or if i reach out to somebody and say like hey let's meet for coffee and just talk about Mm -hmm. something or if it's i'm be bringing on a podcast guest which i have had the best conversation with people recently and i'm really excited to kind of share those episodes out later uh, this year. But um, just putting time in my schedule or finding time in my schedule to meet with these people, whether it's a 30 minute Zoom call or, you know, a two hour coffee uh, meeting, like yep. those conversations. Yeah, you're right. They're not producing anything, but they are, you know, getting me in a business mindset. They're putting me in a growth mindset mm-hmm. and they're helping me to recognize, you know, where I am in my bubble um, especially with my business and where how other people are seeing my business or seeing the things that I say um, and you know how I can uh, better that because a lot of people have different perspectives and I'll say something that seems so obvious to me like oh like I'm you know doing this with my business uh, I'm structuring this with how I communicate with my clients because you know it just seems easy it's easier for me to do that or it seems easy for them to do it but then they ask me a question of like you know, well, how do you do this? Or like, you know, how, how do I get this information? Or, and I'm like, I didn't even think about that. Like, I, I thought that was kind of an obvious button to click or like an obvious thing to do. Or like, I expect them to put a little more effort into this, you know, communication so that, you know, they can get the most value, we can get the most value out of it. And then somebody in a, in a meeting walks up to me and they're like, that makes no sense. Like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, okay. So I need to restructure, you know, I may need to restructure, at least rethink and communicate to uh, whoever the stake, stakeholders are in the process of, you know, how do I change this? Because I had a different perspective on it and, you know, the perspective wasn't shared. So I definitely put a lot of time into whether it's networking opportunities or just taking one-on-one meetings, which is my preferred way of doing things um, just to learn and, you know, talk to people because you never know, like, if those meetings are just going to be, you know, relationship building or if they're going to lead to business in the future. I think going into those meetings um, with the relationship in the front of your brain, but then the business in the back of, the, of, of your head kind of gives you the best outcome there because I you never want to go into a meeting and, like, be ready to pitch them. But you always want to have your pitch ready. I think that's something that I've learned is, you know... Like I, I would walk up to people like when I was really early on, business card in hand, just like ready to talk to them. And now I'm like, business card needs to stay in the pocket until you know we get to a point in the conversation where it makes sense. Like my pitch yeah. is always ready. I, I'm always ready to talk about my business. But if I'm meeting one of some of these people, if I'm meeting like a realtor or something like because I do real estate media and that's you know something that I do a lot. I, I just want to talk to them about you know real estate and the market and you know selling houses and what what you know they need from a marketing professional, from a media professional. And then, you know, if I see it's a good fit or if they like are interested in my services, then I can bring out my business card, show my website, do all these things. So I think, you know, setting time aside for these learning opportunities, these networking opportunities and business meetings is really important, but it's also important just to be in the moment and, you know, build those relationships and just talk um, and learn and, you know, take notes if you want, like write, take notes on a piece of paper. Don't take notes on your computer or your phone. Um, and just kind of learn uh, in those situations, then the, and the business will come later. But um, in the beginning, yeah, just relationships for sure. I love what you said about networking. I think that people, and I, I, I the same thing. When I was starting out, I would have my business cards ready and ready to sell, eager to just get out there and get the next contract. And I realized that I got the whole networking concept wrong. Because it's, it's not, you know, we're not there as salespeople. We're there as people trying to network with other people. We're not trying to sell anything. And so I think that 
I don't know if there's just a whole, uh, you know, misunderstanding around this topic, but for me, networking is that it's just going and meeting people for their relationship part. And maybe some of them will become clients or, or collaborators or people that you're going to be working with. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I agree. I think that a lot of entrepreneurs make that mistake that they only meet with people because they want to get out some, they want something, get something out from that. And I think that it should be, the opposite. What, you know, when I go to a meeting, I always see two, two big opportunities. One, what can they do for me? Of course, as a selfish part of being a business owner. And then, but the other part is what can I do for them? There's always, you know, it's 50, 50 there. And I think that really helps people want to, you know, network and connect more because it's not just about your business, but it's about what can your business do for them. And I think that then that way you can also give value to some people that really can use what you're doing. And so I, I'm an advocate for networking and connecting with people in you know an authentic way before trying to hand a business card and sell something to them. And I, yeah, over these years, I think that that's been one of the, my main strategies for growth is connecting with people, getting to know them. And then some of them became my clients and we have great relationships and they're great clients because of it. And so it's, yeah, I would recommend every entrepreneur to do that instead of just sell, 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 because that, that, that gets rough. It gets really yeah, hard. Absolutely. And also like if you expect people to, you know, vouch for your business or, uh, you know, give you a lead or give you um, a referral, you should be doing the same. And so I've kind of, uh, part is, is selfishly. I mean, there's a selfish aspect to it. I think yeah. every business is not going to agree there, but also like if I see a business I really like, like there's a couple of people that I talk to either for this podcast or just friends that are starting their business. And I really love their idea. Like I'm going to talk about it a lot. Like I, there is a, um, Jack Meyer, he was on this podcast. He's going to uh, have wake surf. Winona, which is a wake surf charter business on Winona Lake. I love his business idea. I love the, you know, the way he's going about it. I think he's really like hungry for business and, I've, I've talked about it with everybody that I can, like in the, in the context of, uh, you know, business owners, because I think his idea is really great. And I have another friend who's an interior designer and she just started her, um, interior design for, firm for Airbnbs and marketing and stuff like that. And like, I think her business idea is great. And I mean, there's, there's a little bit of it where like, we're going to work together on some photography stuff. So there's a little bit of, you know, benefit to me if I share this business, but also like, I just want to see her succeed and I really like love her business model uh, with her and her sister. And so like I'm sharing it all the time and I'm talking to people and, you know, property managers I know and Airbnb owners I know be like, Hey, have you thought about, you know, going the more like designer route in your thing or like, look at this company. They do really good work. Like I, I share about businesses that I'm really excited about and I would hope that people do the same about my business, but I would also never expect them to do the same about my business if I'm not doing the same for other people. So I think, for business owners, it's important to not only network, but find the people you're excited about their business and talk about it and share about it because uh, it's going to come back to, uh, to, you know, help, help you um, in, you know, in times when you won't even expect it, which I think is the biggest thing there. That's so true. Um, I, I know you have a whole agenda, but there's one thing that I would love to talk about if we have the time, which, which is the definition of success for an entrepreneur. And I think that this is preventing a lot of people, not just, not just in the U.S., I bet, uh, uh, you know, around the world, people that think that being an entrepreneur is equivalent to being a millionaire or being, you know, extremely financially stable. And I think that that's one thing that I've realized uh, as I mentor people, that people just get it wrong. They think they have a completely different idea about uh, what being an entrepreneur or the leader of a company means. Um, so maybe we can touch uh, on that at some point, if you want. Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the incubator and just kind of that yeah. process there, but I, we'll get back to that because I think that is a that is very top of mind for me right now. You know, what is my definition of success? Um, because I switched it a lot recently, but I want to talk a little bit more about the Kedco incubator. Um, what did what did you know that process that three day long um, process look like? What were some of the things you were talking about and uh, exercises you were maybe going through? Um, and you know. What, what did you, I mean, you talked about what you got out of it a little bit, but, um, you know, just why was that so beneficial for you? But let's just start with like, what did it all look like and what did you kind of do in the three days? Yeah. So, uh, I think, look, we did a lot of things, so I don't think I can, you know, talk about every specific thing, but I, I would, I would describe it this way. We go in the first day. It's a lot about 
what are some of the new answers or the new ways to look at business and to develop business. And I believe in day two is more, and, and it's throughout the whole incubator, a lot of exercises that allow you to see, oh my goodness, this is the product I want to sell. And these are the things that I actually have to figure out, or these are the things I can do to sell it well. And so it allows you to walk through the entire process of developing a service or, or a product and launching it. And, and so the, the three days break, break that up really well because it allows you to see, you know, from the idea part to the, you know, messaging part behind the product or service to the launching and the strategy behind that. And I, I, I realized that when I went in, I realized I have, I had this idea that this incubator is just going to make it my entire business grow. My entire business is going to grow. I'm going to be able to just take the entire business and propel it through this accelerator, accelerator. But then I realized they actually do it really well because they teach you that each product or service is different, which, you know, should have known by then. And, and so I took one of my products that we recently launched and took it through this entire model process that allows you to see what the product could be or what it needs to be if you really want to sell it successfully. And so I followed the steps uh, for the three days and I got a lot of homework <laughs> after that. I realized I was not in the right path, that it could make some uh, adjustments and I had a lot of work to do, which I loved. And then I went back to my team and we started just doing things differently. And, and that, that product launch uh, so far has been a success because we actually, instead of just launching what we thought was the, the, the right thing to launch, we did the homework. We you know, went back and we restructured a couple of things. And while we're still wanting to, to have it grow more, um, I think the point where we're at now, it is definitely a complete success uh, if we had to compare it to what it could have been if we didn't go through the steps. So uh, just having this incubator allowed us to really be informed as we did this new uh, project and we launched this new product and that, you know, translates to revenue and more contracts and business growth financially. So I would say that's, the most, or that's the biggest thing I got out of it. Uh, but also information uh, and just knowledge as an entrepreneur, I think is all about training ourselves, training uh, what we know, or, or sorry, training our minds. And also knowing that we know a strategy that should work. <laughs> Cause a lot of times we just do a lot of experiments and we have no clue if they're going to work. These are proven methods that work and you learn them, you, you apply them and you see success. So I think that's so important for an entrepreneur. And for me, it is I'm always looking for things that I learn, I can apply and they move the needle for the business. Absolutely. What was the product that you went through the process with? And, uh, you know, what did, what did that launch look like for you um, after the incubator? Yeah. So the, the product that we did was a digital course that teaches people English and is is recorded and done, developed in Spanish. So it's for Spanish speakers to learn English. And um, we I just used the, the product as an example to go through the process. And I realized that pricing was off, strategy for delivery was off, lunch was every, it just a lot of things were off. And so we had to restructure everything. And uh, now that we launched, uh, we've our sales are really good <laughs> and uh, we realized that they wouldn't have been if we didn't do the, we didn't make the adjustments we made. And so um, j just, yeah, an overview of, of, of what that was for us. So it's, um, I, and right now there, you know, things are, are growing. We recently uh, signed a contract with the YMCA uh, to offer this across, you know, the United States and, and Oh, global. that's really cool. So this is our first contract with that, you know, that, that kind of, of, of a reach. And we're really excited because one of the main things that I remember through the incubator is that, um, is that we learned that this product, uh, it, you know, it's our, our, our clients, really our companies, our companies and nonprofits and, and organizations that want to offer this to people in the U S and abroad. And, for the longest time, I thought our customers are, of course, Spanish speakers, but a lot of them don't necessarily want to buy it, don't see the benefit, or don't have the finances to afford an expensive course like this. And so that was 
you know, mind blowing when <laughs> the, the people at the incubator told me your clients are not people, they're your users, your clients are the companies. And I, you know, the first, when I heard that, I was like, there's no way that that's true. It was true. We actually yeah. model ourselves uh, until today are companies and not individuals that have personally purchased the course, which those are little things that if you're inside the business, you can't see because you're just blinded by it. And we're expecting to get more and more sales in both, you know, the customer side and the business side. But uh, just being able to see little things like that has been great. I think has been great for the business and for this specific product. Yeah. And I, I want to say one last thing on that before we get into the year definition of success conversation, because yeah. I think that's a really great thing to talk about. I think, you know, in the business, it is so hard to kind of talk about those, you know, what, who is my market? Who is my customer type high level strategy type things? Because when you're in the business, you're doing all the tactical stuff. You know, you're doing all the emailing, you're doing all the accounting, you're doing all the, you know, paying off uh, a credit card or, you know, you're paying bills, you're, um, you know, messaging people on LinkedIn, you're editing video, you're doing all the little tactical things that, you know, as a high level, you know, person in the business, as the CEO of the company, like we're both CEOs, you know, you don't want to be doing those things. You want to be talking about the strategy, the vision, the mission of the company. But when you're, you know, I'm a solopreneur, you're, um, you have a team, but you started as probably a solo or at least a couple people, you know, in the beginning, you have to do everything. Yep. And, you know, 10 hours of your day is going to be all the tactical stuff, the little things that you have to do that you really should be outsourcing out. But um, so like these incubators and, you know, for me, I haven't done an incubator, but I've just had these conversations. And that's really where I get to do that high level strategy stuff. Yeah. Um, and I found that when I talk to entrepreneurs, it's not only like we're just talking about business that they will actually like come and be like, hey, I looked at your business. I love what you're doing. Have you thought about doing this? And those conversations kind of come out of, they help me kind of think about that high level stuff that I don't have time to do if I'm, you know, doing everything else, which is like for me, a lot of video editing and a lot of, yeah. you know, managing files and all this kind of stuff, like stuff I don't want to do and shouldn't have to do. But, you know, like I think for you, that incubator kind of allowed you to step outside the business and look at it for like, like yeah. what could it be? And then that's where you like, you were like, I have this idea, like, oh, let's run with it and let's go with, you know, what we want to do. And that obviously allowed, uh, allowed you to build a product that has been very successful. You talked about a contract with the YMCA, which is huge um, and more contracts there. So congratulations on that. Um, well, let's kind of close out the podcast with talking about success. Um, I, I totally agree that, you know, the definition of success for everybody is very skewed. You know, for me, in, in the media production business, especially, like I'll see people and be like, oh yeah, I spent, you know, 500 bucks on gear and then I made 10,000 my first year or I made 500,000 my first year with my agency or whatever. And I'm just looking at that like, wow. wh why am I not, like, where is that money? Why am I not doing this? Like, I'm not doing good. And so, I, but like for me, like building relationships is success in some way because that'll lead to clients down the road. So kind of what is your idea on kind of that topic of, you know, the different areas of success and why did you kind of uh, feel so passionate to bring that up right now? Because I think it's a very good topic to talk about. Yeah, no, I, and I think that I want to talk about it because I think that entrepreneurs like you, like me and, and young entrepreneurs uh, around the world should talk more about the reality of most entrepreneurs because that creates a bridge for people that want to start to actually get started because we hear all these millionaires at 22 year old the 22 year old uh, or 23 25 and they're already millionaires and, and that prevents people for, from wanting to start because they start realize oh my goodness I'm not making any money I'm gonna quit I'm not good for this and that's terrible because none of us or most of us don't start that way and, and so that's why I want to talk about the definition of success and for me, I'll tell you about my definition of success when I started out because I think that's gonna give a give perspective uh, of, of what I thought was you know success then it's different now but then I'm 22 years old I'm finishing college I have my business and I, I told myself what are the things that I want in my life to enjoy it to feel that I'm doing the best and all the things that I want to do um, and that was my definition of success. I just wanted to know what do I have to get, at what point do I have to be in order to do what I want to do in life? And I, and I just grabbed a notebook and I wrote down, I want to run my business full time. That's my number one. 
Okay, what does it take to do that? And that's when I wrote down all the requirements and I realized I need to make some, some money because I need to pay my bills. I need to, you know, have this and this. I need a car. I need a laptop. I need the things that I need to run the business and to, to live the life that I wanted to live. So the first thing that I realized, I don't need a fancy car. I don't need fancy technology. I don't need all this money. I don't need this big house. No, because my goal is to run my business full time. And when my goal was this, I, I realized that everything else could wait. It made everything way easier. I realized, well, I don't have to make $100,000 a year. Now I can start making way less because I only have to sustain that life that allows me to do what I want to do. And that was my definition of success. By then, it was probably, what, 30, 30K a year, uh, which is still a lot of money. But if you can do that as an entrepreneur full time, now you can actually do it. <laughs> you know, you don't yeah. have to start big to continue. And, and so uh, that, that those requirements grow, hopefully, and you ch they change over the years. But if you understand really what your goal is, then it's way easier to get started. It's way easier to say no to the car and the house and all this fancy stuff because you know what you want is to run your business full time. To be an entrepreneur, you don't start out as a millionaire. You don't start out as some someone wealthy. And so... I think that a lot of people want to do it all. They want to have the car, the house, the lifestyle, and also they want to be a full-time entrepreneur. Well, guess what? That's really hard because nobody starts big. Most people start from very little and they go, you know, they go up. Um, so I think the definition of success is what actually will allow you to start or not to start. If you need those things, you probably are not as, uh, likely or it's, it's not as possible for you to start being an entrepreneur at a young age because you have to sustain that quality of life that you've imposed on yourself. And it's so hard to start that way. Uh, and then as you grow, um, those things change. And, and, you know, I don't know how it's been for you, but for me, it's been that growth has defined how my definition of success can change. For me, it's always been very similar. I want to be able to do this full time. Maybe now I want to have a, a team member that is full time. I want to have this project. I want to do these things for my community. That adds up to my definition of success. And I've realized that financially, that's very doable for, for a lot of years. Uh, the other thing is that we are really young. And most people think that we're like most people, uh, I mean, meaning us, think that we're getting older or that we don't have time, that we have to rush uh, things. And I've realized that we don't. We have a lot of time. And so if you make $10,000 your first year and $10,000 your second and your third, and then you start growing to 15 and 20, you're doing great. That's awesome. You're growing yeah. you're young. I mean, it's <laughs> I just don't see why or I, I don't like how a lot of entrepreneurs just look at the millionaires and get discouraged by that because they can, they could do it. It's just, they need to sacrifice some things and they need to know what they want. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I agree with everything you just said. You know, I think that's part of the reason I started this podcast is I wanted kind of that realistic look at entrepreneurship right now. Like, you know, I'm still living at, my, at home. I don't, I have a 2001 Honda Civic that has 170 K miles and is probably on its deathbed right now. Like I, I, you know, I don't have, the, the, those finances, but I'm working to that and I'm okay with that right now. Like I see the, the goal. I see where I could be in, you know, a year or two. And, you know, I could have that nice car. I could have that nice house in a year or two if I just put in the work now. And, you know, if you want the nice car right now, go get a job at, you know, a big company and get $75,000, $100,000 a year. If you want the nice house now, do the same thing. But if you, yeah. you know, want to have a business and have a nice car and have a nice house, that's going to take you a couple of years. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you do have an amazing year. Maybe you have the 500K a year, your first year. And that's not the norm. But if you do, that's fantastic. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to, like, say that that's not good. Like, that's amazing. That's what we all kind of want. We all want to have a really big, success, successful year. But it's also important to kind of realize that if you do, you know, 10K in your first year or 20K in your first year and you still live at home or you still, you know, have a roommate or whatever, like, that's totally fine. Like you're, you know, as long as you're growing and as long as you're willing to put in the work, you're doing okay. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard right now and it, it is discouraging, but I think, you know, it's important to kind of reset or refocus your mind on kind of what you really want to do and, you know, how you're going to uh, go about the business. And I think the other thing is you talked about how we're so young, like 
it's we have the time right now to invest in the business. So, you know, for me, like I am very blessed to be able to live in my my uh, parents' home right now and have some of my expenses covered there. So then that allows me to not have to put money towards rent or put money towards, you know, groceries or anything like this. I can, you know, the the money the business is making can go back into the business. I can, you know, invest in. Um, going to a conference that would really help me out, being a vendor at a conference, or I can invest in a piece of gear that would really help me out, like a drone or a gimbal or a camera or something like that. Like I can put the thousand dollars that I earned from a job into that rather than putting the thousand dollars into my rent payment that I'm never going to see, you know, anything from that ever again. So I think the biggest thing is just kind of refocusing your mindset and understanding like it's okay that you're not doing, you know, 50K, 100K, 200K a year. That'll come, and I think every entrepreneur should be, you know, honest in saying that, like, that is that's the real, real, realistic of the situation. Like, you're you're gonna have some hard first years, but if you put in the work and you, you know, focus and you grind and you uh, work really hard and build relationships, like that success will come if you just keep putting in the work. Um, and it's hard some days. It's you don't want to do it some of the days. Like you just want to stay in bed and watch a movie or whatever. But like you know, have those days come and it's, it is what it is, but you got to keep grinding the next day and, uh, you know, putting in that work because that's the only way you're going to get to that nice car and nice house and, you know, financial freedom. I had a lot, a last thought with this, which is something that a mentor told me once. And I just love this. Cause I, I, you know, I repeat it to myself all the time and I tell other entrepreneurs is, um, one of the financial or financial, one of the, 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 the concepts that I define as success is, is having time is the ability to manage your time and just have that asset that is it's the only asset <laughs> that you cannot pay is time. And so when my mentor talked to me, he was challenging me about investing in the business because, you know, we're young and we, we try to protect the little we're making. And uh, he asked me, well, do you think that if you invest in this employee, you can go out with the time that that employee is freeing you up? Uh, do you think you can go and get a contract for the amount of money you're paying your employee. And I thought, that's a good question. And so I hesitated and then I said, absolutely, I can. And he said, well, I'm glad you did because if you would have said no, I would have told you you should shut down. Because if you if you think that your employee working for you is going to be something that doesn't allow you to grow because your time, that time that you now have is not enough for you to grow the business, then you should shut down. And so I realized that that is so true. This is the time to invest. That time that we free ourselves, that, that time that we get is the most valuable thing that we have as, as entrepreneurs because we can get the next contract, because we can plan, because we can do all the things that we couldn't do. And so the other trade-off that I think about is corporate. Um, you know, uh, they pay you, let's say, 50, 60, 70, 70K a year, but they take all of your time. So the question I ask the people I mentor and, and myself all the time, is your time now worth those 70K? Could you make through your business potentially more than 70K a year? And my answer right now is yes, absolutely. And so when I think of that, I say accepting a corporate job right now could be the worst thing I could do. It might be the worst thing a lot of people could do because they're taking away any chance that they will have that time to do um, what they could be doing with their time. And Absolutely. so thinking about that trade-off for me is huge and I encourage people to do it. A lot of people will answer no. I think I'm not going to be able to make the 70K. That's totally fine too. But I think a lot of people might find themselves saying, well, it's not 70K because I'm already making 40 or 50. It's actually 20. So can I make up that difference uh, with a 40, you know, without having that full-time job? The answer is yes, I will say go for it because we're young and this is the time to try. And we, you know, we have little liability uh, when it comes to family and those kinds of things. So, Absolutely. Well, I think there's no better place to end the podcast than on that note. Um, so Lucas, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This is, conversation has been fantastic. If people want to find you online or find Language Matters online, where can they go to, uh, to do that? So both Instagram and Facebook is Language Matters Programs and then LinkedIn is Language Matters. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. 
Perfect. I will have a link in the description for Language Matters. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, even if you are obviously an English speaker, I still think it's a really cool business. Um, and uh, learn more about just what Lucas is doing because I think he's doing a great job. Um, but again, thank you for coming on the podcast. And we will see you next time on the Rest of Us podcast. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Rest of Us podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider leaving a rating or review on the podcasting platform of your choice. It really helps me see that you are enjoying the episode and also helps other people see the podcast. Also, please consider giving a follow on social media. All the links will be in the show notes down below. Also, in the show notes, there is a link to the Rest of Us newsletter. This is a a platform where I'll send out different takeaways from the episode, resources that were mentioned in the episode, and also uh, notifications about new episodes. So make sure you click the link to subscribe there. So episodes are released weekly, and I will see you on the next episode of the Rest of Us podcast.